Okay, well, good morning, everyone. It's good to be back in sort of a normal routine again, uh, but it was nice to kind of step away for the last, really the last month. Um, we kind of had different activities, different things that kind of pulled us away from here, um, but that was okay. You know, we still had church, we still met, we still did things, and um, I think it was beneficial in, in all those ways too. So, um, but getting back into uh, our our normal routine and um, being back with you all is is nice to kind of have this sense of um, normalcy, I guess. So um, this weekend, as um, some of us may or may not recognize, we have a, a hopefully a long weekend for some of you. You got to uh, maybe have tomorrow off, and so you'll have to go to work. All right, it's a good thing having having a day to just do your own thing, if if you will. Um, some maybe don't recognize that and um, still have to go to work. Maybe you work for yourself and you don't recognize the fact that there's a, a federal holiday tomorrow and so it's just another day, right? So you just keep at it. But uh, for those of us uh, maybe that are part of a, a company or a corporation that follows some of those uh, guidelines, you recognize that tomorrow actually is considered Labor Day, a, a federal holiday that was initiated back in the 18, late 1800s. Um, I found out it was 1894 that that was when the federal government initiated the fact that they were going to recognize um, this day, the first Monday in September, as a national holiday. And I'm talking about that today because in the past, I've looked at other holidays um, and the meaning behind them, you know, sometimes why do we recognize and observe holidays? Why do we do some special days and not others? What is it? And it got me thinking about how we observe those in our normal life and secular society culture uh, because that's what's going on around us and it, it impacts our life. But then I also wanted to look at it and say, well, just because I take tomorrow off of work and I don't have to work, maybe there's still yet another reason to use that day for some benefit. And so today I wanted to look at us being able to labor for the Lord and being able to mark this day in a sense that we look forward to each year and say, I'm thankful for those who have labored in the Lord. I'm thankful to those who are willing to come alongside and work, put in the effort, be there beside each other to edify one another, to build each other up, to assist, or to reach out and help those who aren't in the body of Christ, to bring them in. You know, we, we've looked at how we're ambassadors for Christ and we have roles and responsibilities. We have jobs that we're supposed to do that are eternal. They have an eternal weight to them, not just the things of this life, the temporal things. So we go about our days. Most of us will spend a good portion of our day in labor, in work, working toward a purpose, a reason, a goal maybe, or just to provide, just to provide for our families. And we're supposed to. It's not that we're not. I'm not saying that we shouldn't all just give up working and go do you know the fun things in life, although I'm sure we would all feel much better about that. We recognize there's a need, a necessity to labor. And so we have this day, this weekend, that's been set aside to uh, remind those in the American workforce what was done for us prior to this. And I don't want to get into the politics of it um, because there are politics that surround um, some of that. But nevertheless, it helped the American workforce in ways and built it up. And so in a way, we can look back and say that things about what we do today are because of what somebody else did years and years ago, 100 years ago plus. So with that in mind, what does that mean for us spiritually? What does that mean for us as a body of believers, a small body of believers in a small town in central Indiana? What, what does that mean? What are we supposed to, to do with that? And as I mentioned, I, I've looked at um, uh, Memorial Day, uh, kind of recognized the idea that we would memorialize Christ's sacrifice. We, we memorialize um, the, the sacrifice of 
military and what they've done for us to give us the freedoms we have. And so I looked back at that that day and memorialized Christ and the sacrifice he did for us and our liberty and our freedoms. Um, we've looked at uh, Mother's Day and Father's Day and different, different ones. And obviously Easter, Resurrection Sunday, um, maybe Christmas. And the big one that we definitely talk about is Thanksgiving, a big holiday that we definitely like to hold in a little higher regard as far as holidays go, that that one means something, right? That, that, that one means something. Not that we would say that that day is set higher than others and that we, we um, do something specific for that or that our, our, um, our Christianity depends on it in a way. Um, but we recognize that there are times in our lives that it's good to remember. It's good to think back about certain things because it helps us move forward. It helps us create goals. It helps us be thankful for what we have sometimes and be propel us to do something more. It's, it's kind of a, a, a call to action um, to, to do something else. And so looking at that today, uh, I want to, again, kind of, set the theme or set the stage for us to change what we maybe view as just Labor Day being about the American workforce and being thankful for that, but use this Sunday, the first Sunday in, um, in September, that Labor Day weekend, if you will, that Labor Day Sunday, as that's our recognition of, of being thankful for those who labor in the Lord. So our verse for this that I've chosen is uh, first, first Corinthians, I'm sorry, First Corinthians 15, if you'd like to turn there. First Corinthians 15 and verse 58, all the way at the end of the chapter. And we may know this chapter because we come back to the beginning of the chapter for our gospel. It's very succinct and clear and explains what we believe. And when we get to the end of the chapter, he reminds them and says, Therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as ye know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. I'm going to read again. Therefore, my, brethren, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Now it's interesting, he, he talks about it that way, always abounding in the work of the Lord and knowing that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. And I say it's interesting because if you look back and study some things about what labor and work and things are, you might find that some of those things you don't want to abound in, they don't always... Uh, they're not always beneficial necessarily, and sometimes it is vain work. Sometimes the labor doesn't have much meaning. Sometimes you find out that the labor is for loss. And so when Paul is looking at it, he's saying there's definitely a difference in this labor. You have regular labor that you do in your temporary life, in your mortal life that you have to do for the needs of this life and maybe the indulgences of this life, but then you have work that you do for God, dirt work that you do for the Lord that has, has much more uh, weight to it. And it has, it's not in vain, as he says here. So we, we tend to labor or work in our lives because of the American dream, right? The American dream teaches us that if we want to have a nice house, a nice family, a nice a uh, place to live, um, uh, cars, whatever, a, a, a comfortable life, we'll work hard for it to be able to enjoy it, to be able to attain the things that we need. Um, sometimes it's, it's having specific things that we want to possess to give us the comfort. Sometimes it's being able to have the opportunities to go places to enjoy the comfort. And while those aren't necessarily wrong, um, that may not be the best end goal for everything but we will put ourselves through a lot of discomfort to get to those things, right? We'll put in our 40 hour work weeks, 50 hour work weeks, 60 hour work weeks, so that we can attain something. 
We're trying to get to the goal of having the certain amount of money, being able to pay off this certain house that we've chosen to live in, to buy this, these, these things that we want to have because they give us satisfaction. They give us happiness. They, they create a, a sense of enjoyment in our lives. And so sometimes we work hard enough that we don't even get to enjoy it, right? Sometimes we work so hard that we, all the way up through the weekend, kind of when we're supposed to have the time off, we're still having to work because we got to pay off that, that little bit extra. Well, let's go back to Ecclesiastes. We've been reading through Proverbs, um, which is great because it gives us a sense of um, who God is. It gives us a sense of what God is instructing necessarily to the nation of Israel, but also to mankind. You can see, and just as we read through today, there's a lot of one way and then but, right? It, it read through, um, and I, I won't go back through them, but there was always a but in, in each one of those. I think we were in chapter 10 there that, that it, it said something and then it said, but the opposite of is this, right? The, the righteous is this way, the unrighteous is this way. So let's go to Ecclesiastes chapter 5. And here, um, possibly the same writer being Solomon, um, but nevertheless, it kind of follows in the same wise readings type of thing. And the theme of this book is kind of in, in verse 1, or chapter 1 there. I don't want to tell it all, but uh, chapter... Chapter 1, verse 2 says, Vanity of vanities, saith the preacher. Vanity of vanities, all is vanity. What does that mean, right? It's, it's meaningless, right? Everything that we do is meaningless. And he goes on and describes all of it through the book, and then at the end kind of comes back and explains that. But what I wanted to get in, in chapter 5 here is uh, verse 12. It says, The sleep of a laboring man is sweet, whether he eat little or much, but the abundance of the rich will not suffer him to sleep. And I took from that that when you work hard and you sleep, it feels good to put in a good day's work and rest and then get back up and do the same thing. But it says there at the end, but the abundance of the rich will not suffer him to sleep. And I think of that, that somebody who sees somebody else in the abundance of their life they work harder and harder to get what somebody else has. They work harder and harder to have what those people have because I want what they have. Or I want to be able to have abundance and I'm not able to sleep because I have to continue working. Or the stress that it puts on me because I have to pay for these things that I've committed in my life, right? I've I put a 30-year mortgage down, you know, down that now I'm committed to something for the next 30 years that I'm always going to pay this payment, right? And so... I believe one of the Proverbs says that the, the borrower is slave to the lender. So when somebody lends us that money, now we've become the slave to pay them back. We put ourselves back into a, a role. And in some cases, that's necessary, right? To have the ability, the means to, to buy a house and to live that, uh, live that way. But sometimes the <clears throat> near that middle of that verse, the abundance of the rich, sometimes it's more than our needs, right? And we can look at that a lot and say, well, you could get by with less, right? There's a lot of people that show the minimalist lifestyle, the, the idea that it doesn't take everything that you have. You don't have to have the fastest car to get where you're going. It just needs a car, right? You, you don't even have to have a car. You could use a bike. You don't need a bike. You could use a horse, whatever it may be. There's always, you could just walk, right? So there's obviously differences that we we recognize with this but nevertheless we're we're called to labor right even if we go to the very first very first verse in our bible it talks about work right in the beginning god created the heavens and the earth right so from the very beginning we have that established that there's work to be done god started with the work he created all of creation right but Nevertheless, he kind of set that example for us, too. We're going to have to work. And sometimes we, we don't like work. A lot of times we don't like work, right? Our, our lives tend to focus around work. So much is our education. 
our children growing up, going through an education system, is meant to prepare them for a career, right? That's what that's what it's evolved into, is to to establish a baseline and get them prepared for the workforce. That's what our education is. It's so much about career, and so so much less and so little to do with sometimes the realities of life. Sometimes our education, our children, forgets to focus on relationships. How do you deal with the people around you? How do you interact with those who you come in contact with? No, it's more about how do you learn what you need to do to be able to make money? How do you learn what you need to do to be able to provide for what you want? And so our education system pushes children into that. And then we become career oriented, right? You go from one education system to the other and maybe you get a higher education, right? To give you a better career, right? That's what they're, that's what they're teaching us is that we're, we're going to get a better career because we're going to have a higher, because of this higher education. And it's also that we have value and purpose, right? It's, it's so that we can say that our lives meant something because of what we did, how we labored. It's a myth, right? It's a myth that, that all of that is necessary to be able to survive in this life. None of that is ne needed to be able to live. And yet that's what we've been given as our, our um, story, if you will. We've been told that. So much that our careers then become our identity. How many of you, when somebody introduces you or you're introduced to somebody else and they say, you know, who, I'm Mark Harsh. And I explain what I do. I explain that this is my job. This is where I spend a majority of my time, right? It's, and that's, somehow that becomes my life. Somehow now I'm this person, I'm this thing. I'm just, I, I'm relegated to that bit of work. And I get it because we do spend a lot of time at work, right? If you break it out, we spend probably 35% of our week, our life, our year, whatever you want to say, working. And then you may spend another 30%, 33% of it, you know, in sleep, and that leaves you maybe another 30 to 33% in other activities. But if you keep adding to the work side and you just keep increasing that, you're, you know, maybe we're doing it because we think we need more money, we need more stuff, we need more sustenance to, to live to our means that we've got to keep up with the Joneses, right? That's the, uh, the idea. So we, we spend our time, we invest our time in all of this. So our, our identity now becomes, well, I spend so much time doing this, my identity really isn't my, the family that I have. I don't spend as much time with my family, I spend more time at work. And so, that really is what it, what it amounts to. I'm, I'm less of a father than I am an employee because of you know, how that works out. We do it because of the paychecks, right? We focus our life around work because of the income that we need to pay for our needs and indulgences. We need this, right? Again, we, we put ourselves in these predicaments, if you will, where we have to. <clears throat> where we have to pay something. We have to be giving this money away, right? It's, it doesn't, doesn't do any good just to sit. Might as well spend it. We earned it. We got to spend it. And then ultimately, maybe we set some aside for that retirement, right? That chance that someday we'll get to rest. We'll work the 30, 40, 45 years, whatever it takes to be able to get to that point when finally we can just sit back and relax and rest. And that retirement that we no longer have to labor, right? We've done all the right things and set everything up so that our life can continue without us putting out any effort. We can just sit back and enjoy life again or enjoy life maybe for the first time. Maybe we've never enjoyed life because we've always been looking forward to that, that, that hope of, of life. And, and it amazes me sometimes to hear about when people will retire from a very strenuous job, maybe not even a strenuous job, but they've put their life into a job 
and then within a month, two months, six months, a year, they pass away, right? They, they, they've been planning and, and putting it all on that, looking always for that, and once they get there, life cuts them short. And if you read through Ecclesiastes, and since we're there, let's go back to chapter 2. He talks about work in this chapter and labor, but through the whole thing, through the whole book, he's laying out the ideas of life. We put a lot of value into the things that we do in life. And he starts at the top, uh, or it's at, at the beginning of the chapter, talking about with mirth. That's the, that's the um, frivolous life, the, the life of happiness, joy, partying, right? I'm going, to, I'm going to live a life of partying and enjoyment and satisfaction. And he gets to the, to the verse 11. He says, I looked on all the works that my hands had wrought, on the labor that I had labored to do, and behold, it was all vanity and vexation of spirit, and there was no profit under the sun. And I turned to wisdom and the madness and folly, for that man cometh after the king. And so he says, now I'm going to look at wisdom. Wisdom's got to be more than just what it means to live life with all the satisfaction. And he says in verse 17, Therefore I hated life, because the work that is wrought under the sun is grievous unto me, for all is vanity and vexation of spirit. And he goes in, into this next portion. He says, Yea, I hated all my labor, which I had taken in the sun, because I should leave it unto the man that shall be after me. And that's something to think about. When, you, when you're working in a position, and maybe you're working for somebody, sometimes it's set up in a way that if, this, if, if, if you pass away, so much as if you pass away standing there doing your job, they will find a replacement to put in there to keep that job going because that's what production needs, right? We'll, 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 we've got to fill that role. And maybe they'll take a little bit of time off, but nevertheless, your role is, is um, while you believe it necessary in everything about your life, it's expendable. You know, we'll just fill it with somebody else, right? And so we work so hard to do something, and then here the wise saying say, I leave it unto the man that shall be after me. And who knoweth whether he shall be a wise man or a fool? Yet she have rule over all my labor, wherein I have labored, and wherein I have showed myself wise unto the sun. This is also vanity. So we may work and work and work to prove, to do something, maybe because we want to accomplish something, because we want to make our mark, because we want the world to remember us. And yet our work is, once we're gone, because death gets us all, once we're gone, the next person may look at it and say, I don't even need this. I don't even know what they were doing. Or they might use it up and, and it's, they may be a fool with it, right? They may not see the wisdom of what you did and now it's just lost. And he says in verse 20, Therefore I went about to cause my heart to despair for all the labor which I took under the sun. For there is a man whose labor is in wisdom and in knowledge and in equity. Yet to a man that hath not labored therein shall he leave it for his portion. This is also vanity and a great evil. For what hath man of all his labor and of the vexation of his heart wherein he hath labored under the sun? For all his days are sorrows and his travail grief. Yea, his heart taketh not rest in the night. This is also vanity. Ultimately, we're going to die, right? We recognize that. And so the things that we do in this life, and if you, again, read through Ecclesiastes, you'll see him talk about and lay it all out. And this is somebody who understood a lot more than we do, I think, that had opportunity at everything and still said, it's all vanity. Had all the wisdom and understood many things and still said, it's vanity, it's meaningless. It's like a vapor. It's like smoke. It's like something that you want to, you see and you want to grasp, and when you do, it's gone. You can't hold it. You can't keep it because it doesn't have that value that we put into it. So we, we labor sometimes in that same way. And then sometimes we look at labor and we say, labor has this negative outlook, right? And I've gone through some examples there, but all the way back in the Garden of Eden, from the curse of, of, the, of, of the fall, there was a curse on the ground to where man would bring forth the fruit of 
his labor, in a sense, but it was going to be in sorrow, right? So in chapter 3, Genesis chapter 3, and you don't have to turn there, but I just wanted to read what, uh, what God said. He said unto Adam, Because thou hast hearkened unto the voice of thy wife, and hast eaten of the tree which I have commanded thee, saying, Thou shalt not eat of it. Cursed is the ground for thy sake, in sorrow shalt thou eat of it all the days of thy life. Thorns also and thistles shall it bring forth to thee, and thou shalt eat of the herb of the field. In the sweat of thy face thou shalt eat bread till thou return to the ground, for out of it wast thou taken, for dust thou art, and unto dust shalt thou return. There you go. There's life in a nutshell. You're taken out of dust. You're going to return to dust. You're going to work, and it's going to be sorrowful, and you're going to have sweat of thy face. Right? How's that for, you know, in a, in a nutshell, that's it. That's your life, right? And yet we have this time on earth, and we look around and we go, we're making so much of it. We're doing so much. We love what we're doing. And when you look at it from the 30,000-foot 30, 30, view, or from heaven's viewpoint, it's like a blip on a radar, right? It's just a tiny speck, if, he, if, it, if it's even noticeable. <clears throat> and so because of that, because of that curse that happened all the way at the beginning of time, it now carries forward, and we all can say, yes, we recognize that if you go out and, and work, the sweat of your brow is how you get food on your table. You know, there's thorns and thistles. I think when, we, when we're uh, working in the garden, right, it's, that's how we're, we're having to sort through to find, find the food. And then also, um, it, the, the other part of the curse there is that uh, unto the woman, he said, I will greatly multiply thy sorrow and thy conception. In sorrow thou shalt bring forth children. What do we call it when women have children? They go into labor, right? They labor to have that child. And in sorrow, and in, in thy, uh, greatly multiply thy sorrow when thou shalt bring forth children. So again, part of that curse, part of what you have to do in this life to keep life going, right? We have to be able to have children and, and um, uh, descendants. And part of that is painful. It's sorrowful in a way. So of all the things that we've kind of looked at so far, it's negative. It stinks. It's awful, right? There's not much to it. It's not a good, good look for labor. But labor can be a good thing. We can also see the good thing of, of labor. <clears throat> labor produces things. Production, right? We want to say, I did something valuable today. There was production. I, I can say, after I, I did this, now I have something to show for it. That's ultimately what we're trying to do. We just want to show something for what we've done. Something comes from our efforts. That's one thing that we can have from our labor. So <clears throat> in that way, labor, again, can be a good thing. We can see improvement. We can see improvement because we, we labor. We might see this more with um, sports or with bodybuilding or with something that changes your life. Maybe, you're, uh, maybe you want to get on a weight loss program and you want to see improvement, you want to see your weight coming down, uh, changes in your body, um, or you want to see you bulking up, getting bigger, or you want to see yourself getting faster or being able to, to uh, say, basketball. You want to be able to shoot better. And so you labor at it. You work at it. You do things that aren't comfortable. The comfortable thing will get you lazy, will get you overweight, will get you unhealthy, will get you slow. Um, you won't have much to show for it in a way. And yet if we labor, a good thing is you see improvements and that continues to push us on. It makes us feel better about ourselves. We, we like the way we feel. We like the way we look. We like the way we are able to produce something, even if it's a sports, you know, highlight, right? Um, and maybe nobody else sees it, but we spend the time in the gym shooting and we feel good when we make a basket. We feel good when something is, is proof of our efforts. And those are the, the improvements. Labor can be a good thing for fulfilling our needs, right? We're able to provide for our needs. Let's go to 2 Thessalonians. Paul even tells us it's a requirement, right? We have needs in this life. We can't make it through this life without living a mortal life. We have to do it. And so our mortal bodies still require us to fulfill them and sustain them and do something about it. And so for that, we labor. 
And in 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 12, he says, Now them that are such we command and exhort by our Lord Jesus Christ that with quietness they work and they eat their own bread. So the idea here is we've got to work. We've got to do something about it. We have to put forth an effort and eat their own bread because they provided for themselves. And if you flip over to 1 uh, Timothy, maybe just a few pages over, 1 Timothy chapter 5, he says in verse 8, But if any provide not for his own, and especially for those of his house, he hath denied the faith and is worse than an infidel. Provision. We have to provide for ourselves, and that takes labor. Right? If we don't, we wind up with the idea that we're supposed to steal. Right? That we're supposed to take from others to be able to provide for ourselves. That If we don't want to labor, if we don't want to put in the effort, if we don't want to come by it um, properly, we'll just take it from somebody else. And that there has its own issues and merits and problems behind it. So here he says in 1 Timothy that if you don't provide for your own family, that's worse than being unsaved. So there's, there's a reason, a purpose, a need that we have to fulfill needs, fulfill purpose in our lives to sustain our life and those that are in our care in a way. And then finally, labor can be a good thing in a legacy. The things that we leave behind. We look, looked at uh, in Ecclesiastes how once you do something, it can be taken away. Right? The next person that comes along, it can just be taken away. It can be, um, it can be replaced. Right? That, that, that role can be replaced. There's, there's nothing special there. But yet, there can be some things that do leave behind a legacy. You can build something that somebody could come along later and say, wow, look what that person did. And we may go to a very old uh, uh, structure. A lot of times we'll look at architecture with that in mind and may say, look what they did many years ago. Look how they were able to build this and it still stands. It has that firm foundation. That structure is still standing. They did a great job. They left a legacy with that. People can see that and know. And maybe you don't know specifically who built it, but you know you know, maybe the group or whatever. <clears throat> and so there's things behind or that can be left behind that can be a good thing. So with all of these temporal things in our lives, the, the things of our mortal life that we look at and we see around us, we still have yet a whole other task, a whole other work that we're supposed to do that's so much more profitable, so much more beneficial, and so much more needed right? We spend so much of our effort focused on the things that we see and do and have around us because we're mortal beings. We're temporal beings. We have that. And yet we know that we have an eternal spirit. We have a soul about us that goes on beyond these things. And if we didn't, um, what's the purpose, right? So back in that verse that we started with, therefore, my brethren, beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as ye know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. He tells us our labor is not in vain in the Lord. So all the things that I've kind of led up till now, those are the vanities of vanities. Those are the things that really become meaningless. They can be brushed to the side and said, that's no big deal. Yeah, other people have done the same thing. Sure, they provided for their family. Sure, they built something. Sure, that something else has happened, but really, what, what good is it? But when we look at laboring for the Lord, there's something else about it. So, I want to say first that there's, a, there's a, a reason, I think it's called laboring for the Lord. Because it takes work. It's not easy. <clears throat> it doesn't come naturally to us. Um, even though we're spiritual beings, even though we are eternal now, even though we are saved and in the body of Christ, we just don't get imparted the wisdom. We don't just get imparted the, the zeal, the drive. It's not just given to us to just, hey, let's go after it. Now, at the beginning, we might feel that way, but it typically wanes. It typically falls off because there's people around us that kind of 
pull down on that, uh, that, that desire, that drive, right? We come out full of energy and yet things around us, whether it be our normal life or bad attitudes from other people or rejection or whatever it may be, really just sets us back on our heels and it's like, well, maybe that's not what I'm supposed to be doing. Maybe, I'm, maybe I shouldn't go so aggressively at it. Maybe I shouldn't be on fire for God. Well, the, one of the big things about labor and laboring for the Lord is relationships. We have to create and maintain <clears throat> create and maintain relationships. And that's not easy. That's laboring. People are difficult, right? And maybe we're the ones that are difficult in that, you know, in that interaction, but it's not easy to maintain relationships. It's not easy to start relationships. You know, you can look at a child, a five and six year old, and they'll meet somebody they don't know, another five and six year old or whatever, and they're best friends right off the bat. You know, they they find some you know, quirky thing that they like together and immediately they're friends. They can talk, they can chat, they can play, they can do whatever. And yet adults, we can't do it, right? We struggle to be able to find interaction and we always have these guards up. It's like, well, I don't want to just put myself out there with this person. And so we don't know how to relate with people. And I kind of go back to that's where part of our problem is with the education system that we're so focused on the wisdom in the mind and making sure that people understand certain things about their career that they're going to be going into that they forget how to work with other people around them, how to function in society with people they interact with. And I don't want to say that it's a generational thing, but right now it's becoming a societal thing that we don't have to interact with people anymore. We have so many other ways to meet and communicate that doesn't have to be a face-to-face interaction where you have to be who you are in front of that person. You can be somebody else in so many different ways to someone and interact with them, whether it be through text messages, even a phone call, um, uh, being on chats or whatever, being in, in things that you don't even have to, you know, you can put up a different image of yourself and people don't know who you are. And so they just take that image as this is who I'm talking to. And so, there's all kinds of things in this digital society that we're in right now that make it even harder to create and maintain relationships. We, meet, we make it sound like it's easier. They, they say, oh, you have all these different ways that now you can interact this way. You can communicate this way. And yet it takes away from the, the direct one-to-one, the, the communication that we have that we have right now, that we're here together in this room and we have this communication together. Now, right, so, yeah, right now it's one-sided maybe, but I feel communication from each of you right now too. And if I was just standing here and there was nobody else in this room and I just had a camera in front of me, you know, that feels completely different than if I'm standing in front of a room with people that are looking back at me and I can pick up and sense how they're communicating with me, even nonverbal. So, Creating relationships is, is a big step and a, it's a must. If we're, going to do, if we're going to labor for the Lord, it is an absolute must. Because otherwise, people don't want to hear it. People don't care, maybe. It means a lot more when you can have the relationships. There are definitely tools and things out there that I can say, okay, I can pick up a, a book that somebody else wrote. And we had Wesel and Daisy here um, a month or so ago, and they're doing a work in a ministry that's very beneficial. They're, they're getting books created in languages that people can, can read. And so that in itself is a great labor. But I believe that even beyond that, and, and I don't want to dismiss that or say that that's not necessary in any way. I'm saying that that tool still leaves the communication that if somebody could talk with you and communicate directly with you. So that's why I think relationships matter even more than the, the benefits that we de- do and gain from um, text or from um, books and things that, that we can and and videos that maybe we can watch. Um, 
Another portion of laboring for the Lord is that's that's difficult, maybe, and it's the negative is that it takes work to understand the material, right? Second Timothy two fifteen says, "Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth." There's work involved, and there's approval because of that work, and study is not easy. Even if you go to the end of Ecclesiastes, there it says that of the end of uh, of the end of books, there is none. I think you know that basically you can continue to write books and books, and study is difficult. Study is hard, and so when we see it there in in Second Timothy two, study is not easy. You know that from going through school, just learning anything, study is difficult. So it takes work to understand the material, but there is benefit from it. And in Colossians chapter one, in verse twenty nine, he Paul says. In 28, he says, Whom we preach, warning every man, teaching every man in all wisdom, that we may present every man perfect in Christ Jesus, whereunto I also labor, striving according to his working, which worketh in me mightily. So through Paul's work, working for the Lord, laboring, he says, striving according to his working, it worketh in me mightily. So that's part of that improvement. That's part of that Okay, even though I'm putting in this effort, I can see that there's improvement in me. And that happens through our study. The more effort we put into our study, the more it benefits us. And we can hopefully see that improvement. If we were to mark, you know, what we've done over the last year, you know, if we were to say at this point, I'm at this, you know, stage in my, in my um, spiritual growth, and then... I study hard and I, I work and I labor in the ministry for God. And then a year later, I take another reflection of who I am and what I've done in my spiritual life. Hopefully I can see improvement. Hopefully we'll see something that changes and it happens within us. We may not see something physically like what we might see if we were trying to lose weight or build up muscle or, you know, get faster in some way, but it, it works in us. And so he says, it worketh in me mightily there. So we can benefit, we ourselves can benefit from the labor, right? But it also benefits others. The work that we do benefits others. That's the point of it. Now I mentioned earlier that um, we run out of time. We're all going to die. Death is not a respecter of persons, right? Every person is appointed once to die, it says. We're all given this life, and ultimately, in our mortal life, we will die. And we don't know when it's going to be. So, in our earthly ministry, in our work for the Lord, in our laboring for the Lord, we have to redeem the time, right? And it may be a verse you're familiar with. Ephesians 5, verse 15 says, See then that ye walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time, because the days are evil. We have to labor, redeeming the time, buying up the time, as it says, buying up the time because the days are evil. There's evil all around us. They're getting more and more evil, right? And every generation will probably say that. <clears throat> and so we have to be ready, we have to be prepared, and we have to know how to labor properly. Because it says, see then that you walk circumspectly, right? Circum Specially means all around you, being aware of what is always around you, circumference. See then that you walk circumspectly, not as fools. A fool will walk around aimless, not really caring, not really worried what's around them. And sometimes those people walk off cliffs because they're not paying attention. And in a way, that's a foolish, while it may be a very sad situation, there's times where people will be doing something, a phone in their hand or whatever, not paying attention, and will take a step too far and walk right off a cliff or walk into danger, right? And if you're not walking circumspectly, you're walking as a fool. And so he says, walk as wise, redeeming the time. Because we have labor to do. We have work to do. More than just our mortal work. We still have our mortal work. We have to provide for our needs. We have to sustain life. If we stop providing meals for ourselves, our body is going to wither and decay and die, and we're not going to be able to do the Lord's work on the earth. But if we keep ourselves healthy and we provide the means necessary to sustain life, 
through food, wherever else, then we'll be able to continue the work of the Lord here on the earth. <clears throat> now, as I said before, it works in us, but ultimately it has eternal benefits. Working for the Lord has eternal benefits. We looked at all the things that can just be taken away from us, that they're, they're, the, the mortal things that we do in life are nothing. You know, where moth and rust destroy, I think uh, Jesus said in, um, I think it was in the Sermon on the Mount, but nevertheless, the idea that you, the treasures that we have on earth are they're meaningless. They're vanity of vanities, as it says in Ecclesiastes. But we have eternal. So 1 Corinthians chapter 15. We'll read through this pretty quickly, but 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 10. It says, But by the grace of God I am what I am, and His grace which was bestowed upon me was not in vain, but I labored more abundantly than they all. Yet not I, but the grace of God which was with me. Therefore, whether it were I or they, so we preach, and so ye believed. Now if Christ be preached that he rose from the dead, how say some among you that there is no resurrection of the dead? But if there be no resurrection of the dead, then is Christ not risen. And if Christ be not risen, then our preaching vain. And your faith is also vain. Yea, and we are found false witnesses of God, because we have testified of God that he raised up Christ, whom he raised not up, if so be that the dead rise not. For if the dead rise not, then is not Christ raised. And if Christ be not raised, your faith is in vain. Ye are yet in your sins. Then they also which are fallen asleep in Christ are perished. If in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men most miserable. But now is Christ risen from the dead and become the first fruits of them that slept. All of that says the same thing that was happening back in Ecclesiastes, that life is just what we have on this earth, right? You only live once, eat, drink, and be merry, live life to the fullest. You know, he who dies with the most toys wins, right? So all of that is, it's all right here. Let's just live it up for the life we've got right now. And this kind of bears that out. If that's the case, then What's he say there? Your faith is in vain. You're yet in your sins. If Christ isn't raised from the dead, if we don't have hope of resurrection, then all of that's the same. It's all meaningless. But it's not meaningless. Our hope isn't in vain. Our faith is not in vain. But now is Christ risen from the dead and become the first fruits of them that slept. We are not all men most miserable. We have hope beyond this life. In verse 19, if in this life only we have hope in Christ, but we have hope in Christ beyond this life, we are of all men most miserable. No, we are not. We can joy and find happiness and take comfort in the fact that there is a resurrection. And so when we get to the end of this life, if we're able to live out our mortal days and feel the end of life coming upon us, we know that there's still a resurrection. We know that this little bit that we have right now is going to be you know, a vapor but we have something beyond that. So we have eternal benefits. We have more than life after this death. So we can feel excitement from that. And we can also feel excitement from those around us that we can bring into the body of Christ. Ultimately, that's our goal, to build up the body of Christ in number and in strength, to give us power, to edify, to, to, to become wise in who we are as members of the body of Christ. And if we go to Colossians chapter 4, Paul speaks to them, is thankful for them, and excited for them. And he says, chapter 4, verse 12, he says, Epaphras, who is one of you, a servant of Christ, saluteth you, always laboring fervently for you in prayers. And that's such an interesting image. Laboring fervently for you in prayers, that ye may stand perfect and complete in all the will of God, for I bear him record that he hath a great zeal for you and them that are in Laodicea and them in Hierapolis. This particular person, Epaphras, a fellow worker with, with Paul, who he names by name here and says, he saluteth you. He's thankful for you, laboring fervently in prayers for you, doing the work of the Lord. 
that ye may stand perfect and complete in all the will of God. These are the things that he's praying. And he has this zeal, he says, a great zeal for you. That's somebody who has taken what they've learned and are acting on it, right? They're showing an improvement. They're showing production. They're fulfilling the needs of those around them. So he's, in this way, built up the body of Christ by, by number and by strength. <clears throat> and in that body, right, we've, we've seen images or, or talked about the, the picture of that and what that means. And I'm going to flip over to 1 Corinthians chapter 3 and talk about how we're, we're workers together, how we labor together. And this is um, where he's talking about the difference between other ministers and maybe who they're following, right? And he's trying to correct them in this, in this matter. And he wants to show that we labor together. So 1 Corinthians chapter 3, Paul goes uh, in verse 6, he says, I have planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the increase. So then, neither is he that planteth anything, neither he that watereth, but God that giveth the increase. Now he that planteth and he that watereth are one, and every man, uh, every man shall re receive his own reward according to his own labor. For we are laborers together with God. Ye are God's husbandry, ye are God's building. According to the grace of God, which is given unto me as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation, and another buildeth thereon. But let every man take heed how he buildeth thereupon. For other foundation can no man lay than that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. We're working together. We don't need to follow after one person because one person is better, sounds better, does better, whatever. We need to recognize the members in the body of Christ are here to work together. We're laborers together with God. Ye are God's building. And he goes on there at the, uh, in, in verse 10 and says, I am a wise master builder. And he lays that, thing, that foundation and another builds upon. And this is part of that legacy. That when we build something, somebody else can come along and build, and build on top of it. Now in the, in the portion of Ecclesiastes that we looked at, there was no building upon really. Somebody else may come along and they may be a fool who doesn't know how to build upon what I've built and it all gets ruined. And they may tear out the foundation I've got because they think they've got a better way now. And they may build it their way and then the next person behind them may come along and tear out their foundation and build upon it. But when we build and we work in the body of Christ, we're building on Jesus Christ, which is the foundation. And then we lay our foundation above that. We build upon that. And so when we leave that legacy, hopefully somebody else comes along and says, I see what this person did before me, and I'm going to continue to build on that. They put in effort, and I can see the effort that they've done, and it's benefited me. I've seen benefit from what they've done, and now I can take a step forward because of that. It's like a stair step almost, maybe, if you want to visualize that. Somebody builds a step, and then somebody else builds the next step, and then you build the next step, and we're able to continue to progress because of that, right? So we have that picture for us, that we're laboring together, that we have a purpose to work together, not to strive with each other, but to work together for that purpose. And that purpose is in God. It's not just in the things of this life where we, where we typically get our eyes focused, right? And that's why Paul even tells us in Colossians to set our minds and affections on things above, because we're going to set our affections on things around us. So we're working together. We're working together to build something for the Lord. And then finally, as I've kind of singled out today, in this one day, the idea behind it being thankful. Being thankful for those who are willing to labor with us. So I'm going to go back to 2 Thessalonians chapter 1. 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, Paul says in verse 3, We are bound to thank God always for you, brethren, as it is meet. Because that your faith groweth exceedingly, and the charity of every one of you all toward each other aboundeth. We meet together as, a mem as members in this body, and as members of a bigger body, the body of Christ. But we're here to work together. We're here to labor together. And we want to be 
mindful of each other. We want to create relationships with one another, maintain those relationships with one another. We want to work together to see each other be stronger in ourselves within the body of Christ, but then also work together to make the ministry stronger, right? That we're working for something that's not just, oh, we have a bigger building. Oh, we have brighter walls. Oh, we have... Um, uh, you know, something that makes our church set apart from some other church because you can see it, you know, it, it, it looks different than that. Now we're working for the eternal things, the things that aren't seen all the time. And with all of that work, hopefully we can find some thankfulness. I'm bound to thank God always for you, brethren, because of your faith groweth exceedingly and the charity of every one of you all toward each other aboundeth. <clears throat> I think of Don. Everything that he did before we knew Don continued to build to where he set a foundation, right? <clears throat> and we're here in this assembly because of work that he did and relationships that he made. <clears throat> Excuse me. So, when I think of Labor Day, I want to think of people who have gone before us, people who are working with us, those we can be thankful to for the efforts that we put into one another. I'm thankful to all of you for this ministry that we work in together, right? This isn't just one person's work. We're all doing this together. We come alongside one another and we build each other up and we care for one another and we meet each other's needs. And so highlighting who we are and what we do should be our Labor Day. So I say we take back Labor Day in that sense. That Labor Day Sunday is ours for remembering the work of the Lord. It's interesting that Paul, I think in nine of his 13 letters, and if you go to Romans chapter 16, the end of that one, And not, I think I counted nine. He says, and I'll read through a few of these. Um, in verse seven, he says, or verse six, he says, Greet Mary, who bestowed much labor on us. Salute Andronicus and Junia, my kinsmen and my fellow prisoners, who are of note among the apostles who were also in Christ before me. Greet Am Ampiphilus, my beloved in, in the Lord. Salute Urbane, our helper in Christ, and Statius, my beloved. So salute Apelles, approved, and you can go on through this. Salute Herodian, salute Trophina, salute Rufus, salute, and he just names all these people who are fellow laborers with him. And maybe in our mindset we have that idea that you know saluting is this military thing, but it's this idea that I have, <clears throat> I have a, a, an amount of thanks and a blessing that I want to give somebody. I want to thank them and bless them for what they've done for me. And sometimes um, he may have said, you know, um, salute them and he, they're bringing you something. You know, they wanted to do something, you know, to benefit you. Um, but nevertheless, he goes through in many of his, his, uh, uh, his letters there, and that's kind of the end. It's talking about all the people who are his fellow laborers and reminding people, salute them. You know, when they come around, <clears throat> salute them, greet them. So I hope that going through this today and taking a look at what society will continue to remind us about being a federal holiday, Labor Day, that we can look at it from a spiritual way and say, I recognize there's a temporal societal reason for this. Fine. Fine. But I also recognize this is a way that will remind me, hey, I want to be thankful for the people around me that work in the ministry in the Lord for us. And so I'll reread this, fun, this verse as a reminder. 1 Corinthians 15, 58. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. We work because it's necessary for our temporal life. We work because it's necessary 
because we have eternal hope and our labor is not in vain in the Lord. And I'll close with that. So if you have any questions or comments. <clears throat> All right. Oh, yeah. Um, I thought this was a good, a good lesson for me to remember. You know, sometimes just with the daily grind, I get weary of labor. Yeah. Yeah, I just get tired of it. But... And it, I think everybody can relate in some sense, whether they're, no matter what they're doing, whether it's a job or, you know, chores around the house. Um, we all have things in life that we don't enjoy, but it has to be done. Um, and so it's a good reminder, you know, I get weary of the labor, but there's a higher purpose, there's a higher calling. And like even the, the Ten Commandments, the one commandment, we, we tend to uh, think about remembering the Sabbath. Mm -hmm. But the other part of that commandment was in six days thou shalt do thy labor. Yeah. So it was a command to work. Um, and so God expects us to work. But like you mentioned, I, I appreciate how you went to Ecclesiastes because you take God out of the picture, it's all vanity. Yeah. I mean, it's just emptiness and it's frustration because of what's going to happen to all your work after you're gone. You know, potentially comes to nothing. But with God in the picture, it's different. And so that's what I see with um, the difference between 1 Corinthians 15, 58 versus Ecclesiastes. Yep. Is as potentially everything we do can be meaningful if we are doing it for the Lord's cause and for the Lord's sake. And so, you know, even... It comes down to the difference between doing it for the flesh or doing it for God's glory. And I think of it like in <clears throat> Galatians chapter 6, it says that, Be not deceived, God is not mocked, for whatsoever man soweth, that shall he also reap. He that soweth to his flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption, but he that soweth to the Spirit shall of the Spirit reap life everlasting let us not be weary in well-doing for in due season we shall reap if we faint not mm. so what i see is like in ecclesiastes solomon was talking about just sowing to the flesh but you can take those same things and turn it around for for god's glory yep. and sow to the spirit because god does call us to work um, but he want, doesn't want us to do it just to stockpile our own wealth, just to stockpile our own leisure lifestyle and to live for selfish purposes. That's sowing to the flesh. But when we do this to benefit others, whether it's household chores, we're doing it to benefit those that live with us. Whether it's going out in the workplace and earning money, we're doing that to benefit those whom we share life with, um, those that have needs around us. And so all of that you know, can be done for God's glory. And when we keep that proper perspective, we tend to not be as weary in doing it because we realize there's a higher purpose, there's a higher calling for all of us. Hmm. And and I think that's a, that for me is a, a powerful reminder when we think about Labor Day and laboring, that ultimately, if I keep God in the picture, it's motivating to me and it's not in vain. Uh, the other thing that I was really impressed with and never thought about really was what the verses you took us to in Colossians chapter 4. It says, Epaphras saluteth you always laboring fervent, fervently for you in prayers. And I thought about the, the our laboring for the Lord you mentioned has, has to do with relationships because it is about serving those around us and relationships take work and, and so forth. And I think that's good. I was reminded of a saying I'd heard one time that as we think about ministering to other people or sharing the gospel with other people, however that works, people don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. And I think that's powerful because if you're just sharing knowledge and wisdom or whatever, yep. just to show how wise you are, smart you are, how right you are, people can sense that. 
But when they understand, whether it's because you tell them bluntly or because it's subtle communication, when they sense that you deeply care about them, they're much more in tune with what you are saying. And so I think that's a powerful lesson that even Epaphras had a handle on. We need to pray for other people because in our praying, and this is something that I fall short on too, I get, I get weary in praying. Um, but when we pray for other people, I think that's when God places the, the burden of love and caring for that individual within us that then manifests mm -hmm. itself to those people. And so I think that's a powerful lesson for me too to share with everybody else. Yeah. Yeah, and I think that's a maybe sometimes a a difficult one to we we talk about praying for one another, but that, that the stress that we may put on that that's needed to where it will then work in us effectually. Um, and so yeah, it was interesting like like you said and I I hadn't seen it really either. And then going through the study and seeing that the way he describes him there, laboring fervently and having a zeal for them, just was, it's empowering because it gives us, you know, hopefully that's the kind of thing that gives us the strength to to want to lean into something more. So, yes. And highlight kind of like you did through this study that. I feel like we put too much stress on labor as things we do with our hands. Even as Christians, like, you know, we think, you know, so for instance, somebody has a hardship or a death in the family, what do we do? We bring food. So, you know, and noting that laboring is also caring for somebody through prayer and those sorts of things, I think that gets lost. I mean, even in the Christian life. Mm. And so I think that's a good good thing to note because there is, I mean, so many places, like you pointed out in the Bible, that talks about labor, but they're not necessarily talking about laboring yeah. to do things. Right. And we really get caught up in that. We think, you know, and we've talked about that before in other, in other studies, it's the doing that we get caught up in, and it's not necessarily the relationship which is the labor. Relationships are labor. Every relationship mm -hmm. takes an amount of labor to maintain and even to start. Yeah. You mentioned, so yeah. I think that's great insight. Yeah. And sometimes, um, I think in, in side uh, comments before that we've had in conversations, people have said that it's sometimes it's easier to just go out and put in a day's work of manual labor than it is to do some stressful work where you're really having to think and it taxes your mind and you spend so much on that and that's kind of what you're, you're I think you're saying there is that we we see the benefits because when you work with your hands you can see something happening and sometimes when you're just caring for somebody and just doing so and being with someone and nurturing someone it's not always about a physical production of something you're just you're sharing relationship and you're you're meeting a a spiritual need in a way that they they need and it, it can be taxing it can wear on you because yeah maybe you're spending time in prayer or maybe you're just with that person and it hurts it hurts to be in a, a season of life with them that they're going through and and that can just wear on our bodies that it, it feels almost worse than if I just went out and shoveled a hole for eight hours kind of thing so all right. Well, we'll close in a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we are grateful that uh, you have given us a model in a way that we can follow and that we can see that you've explained the purposes for our time on earth and that it doesn't always have to be vanity, that it doesn't always have to be meaningless. If we put our focus on you, and if we are saved in the body of Christ, we have eternal life. But we know there are many, many around us that don't have that hope and don't even know that they need that hope. And they suffer and they struggle and they, they get through this life and sometimes they think they're doing it comfortably. 
And yet at the end, it's all going to be meaningless. And so I pray for those people that there are others around them that are willing and able to put in the labor of the Lord to, to meet them and to relate with them and to share with them the good news of the Gospel of Christ. Because that is the hope that they need, that we all need. And I pray that each one of us understand our role in our ministry and that while it's difficult and can be taxing, it has a greater purpose, it has a greater meaning, and there is a great, great reward ahead of us. And we take glory in that, and we have hope in that, and we're thankful for that. Amen.